So do I need to put the grid in? I think we're all really familiar with the grid by now. Um, so we know we can see from this drawing that the chimney, if I put the grid, that might be more effective actually. Just imagine the grid on the photo itself, something like that. So in this section here, we're gonna make sure that that area there is going to get the line share of detail. That's gonna be you know, the focal point, but it does spill out a bit. It goes both right, it goes left. So I have, a, as I say, a chimney about here somewhere. And I'm guessing the scale and size. Sometimes I go a little bit bigger than I'd intended, but it, it, that doesn't really matter. Um, as long as you get, as long as you confine this part of the image um, within a, a scale size that, uh, you know, that it doesn't wander down here. You don't, you don't end up with the, um, with the bottom of the building right down the bottom in the field area, because you do want this, this area about here is all going to be field from here down. So it's a nice abstract loads of abstract shapes in here. There's a few houses in the background, but I'm not really um, not really concerned with those. A couple of little white houses. I'm more concerned with what's going on in the immediate foreground. There seems to be a, 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 a wall here. So a sort of side elevation here. I've tried to draw this in quite heavy so you can see it. There's a nice angle of a second wall. And of course, in front of all this, there's huge stones in the um, the wall uh, that um, shows us where the edge of the field is. Old stone wall, dry stone wall. And it's something like this. So the cottage then becomes, so I've, got, I've just put in, that's the derelict section of this, of this cottage. And then we get another triangle here, slightly lower if you if you study it, if you look at it. Okay. Slightly lower. It's quite a shallow, shallow triangle. It looks something like that, but that's the wall, adjoining wall to the uh, derelict part. It's, as long as it makes sense to you, I, I think I've written this in many of the um, the lesson packs. As long as the drawing makes sense to you, because I didn't realize until after I'd drawn this the first time that, um, that this was actually a wall, this section here, adjoining wall from the old building to the new. You know, I'm pretty sure that's what we're looking at there. But I, I managed to sort of, even though I didn't know that when I was drawing it, it still looked okay. It didn't, it didn't look anything odd about this. I just assumed that this was just a, a vertical there until I studied the photo a little closer. So um, it just goes to show that it does, uh, 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 you know, that, that level of, that degree of accuracy is not always necessary. So there's some dormer windows here. There is a slight, and I mean slight, uh, bit of perspective here. It seems to sort of, there's almost as though there's a marker point just about here and a straight line that runs all the way down to the far end of the second building there. And so you get your measurements and scale here by looking at the grid. If you look at the photo, see how by placing the grid, I know that my building does not go quite as far as the second vertical um, grid line. It just falls short because it, trust me, it would be so easy just when you're drawing just to push these buildings and end up over here somewhere. You know, the roof here, the chimney over here, and you're elongating it. Um, so, which wouldn't be a massive crime. There's, there's nothing that wrong in doing that. It's just that um, you might then struggle to keep the interest to a, a focal point territory because it's too spread out. You'd have to, if you did do that, you'd have to sort of play that part of the building down over here and make sure that only this area of your building 
um, really was showing uh, any in you know an area of interest, most in, most interesting area. Sorry, so I just find it easier sometimes to confine things um, to where they should be. So this line work I'm doing here now, my pencil doesn't come off the paper too often. It, it runs a little line between each little facet, each little stone face. Um, and it, the, the wall does go a little bit beyond the vertical of the furthest building. Just disappears. It seems to disappear down a bit of a slope over here. So as long as you're happy with um, the scale of things, see how the um, stone shapes, the, 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 the rocks that are in the wall here are bigger here where they are closer to us. And as I move down the field, down the, down the wall, those shapes become increasingly smaller. When in the real world, of course, the stones that are in this wall, further down here, exactly the same size as the, as, as the stones that are making up this part of the wall. Just the effects of perspective. So, um, that's probably enough. I toyed with the idea with this painting when I first saw it of um, perhaps using a bit of masking fluid um, on some of the tops of the stone walls. Um, I've People sort of know me, um, they know I, I'm not a huge fan of masking fluid. Um, and it is just a personal thing, folks. Please don't think, you know, I'm, to, I, I'm sort of dictating to people sort of saying, whatever you do, don't use masking fluid. No, please, please use masking fluid if it works for you. I'll just explain why I don't like masking fluid. Um, I fear, one thing I fear more than anything else is having to stop mid ship, mid flow. Once my, um, once my sort of art brain, my painting brain um, engages, I don't like breaking that momentum. Um, and what, uh, uh, what masking fluid does is you have to draw it out, you have to then decide what you're going to mask out with masking fluid. Um, you then got to, once the masking fluid is on the paper, you've got to wait at least 10, 50 minutes. You can't speed dry the stuff because that makes it difficult to get off the paper. It starts tearing up the paper. So you've got to apply it cold, wait, for, as I say, 10, 15 minutes for it to dry before you can put paint anywhere near it. Because if there's any moisture, if, there's, if that's, if that masking fluid is still wet it reacts with the water because it is soluble when it's still you know until it's inert sort of thing or till it dries off fully so you gotta wait that time and then of course at some point during that process um you will have to remove or you you will want there'll be a time to remove the masking fluid um there's two things here um one it leaves a very hard artificial edge um, which you have to manipulate. No big issue, that in particular. But the other main issue, again, is that, um, you know, it's that waiting time. You, you, you've had to wait for it to dry. You, you, you can't take the masking fluid off if your painting is still wet, because, again, you'll just tear paper. and You make a horrible, dirty mess from where the masking fluid comes up from. Now, most other people who've got more patience than me. So their paintings, they, they're quite happy to start a painting at nine o'clock in the morning, use a bit of masking fluid and be uh, on that painting for two or three hours. Um, that, that simply doesn't work for, for my way of painting. It might work for yours, folks. So please don't, um, you know, uh, I, I just, my ways are not gospel. They're just my ways. Um, so try it uh, and be my guest. If, if you think it'll work for you, use masking fluid. It's not that I don't like paintings with the, where the artist has used masking fluid. I know there's, you know there's so many good watercolorists out there that use masking fluid. And I look at their work and think, oh, that's beautiful. That's, that's fantastic. It, it's just not for me. It just doesn't work for me. Um, okay, so I've just penciled in, you know, an idea as to where some of these bigger poppies he uh, heads are. Now, here's a big tip, a big, big tip. If you look at our photo, the poppies appear en masse. They are, um, there's only one or two poppies that you could probably isolate and say that's a single 
flower head. That's a single poppy head. Most of them are, uh, you know, they're integrated. Sorry, they, 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 they make up large abstract shapes um, that, because they're on mass. Um, so um, what I'm going to say to you is this. Anything sort of from here upwards, um, we deal with uh, shapes on mass. Only down here do we suggest the odd individual isolated flower head. Now, I don't think the photo gives us the correct scale because of the fisheye lens effects of photographs, you know, it, it, the curvature. Um, and so it, what it does, it can, it can make quite large flower heads down here look quite small. They're really in our faces. You know, we can almost re reach out and, and pick a flower head with our hand. So make sure you don't follow the scale of the photo. Make sure that these closer poppy heads are much bigger. That's a single poppy head there. You know, that is so much bigger than what appears uh, in the photo. This is an, an, another reason why you know, I always say to people, yeah, work from photos by all means, but understand a few things about photos. Um, and this is one of them, how, how scale is very deceptive in photographs. Anyway, uh, so we have a distant bit of land. And I'm going to say about the water, there's a little hint of the sea about here somewhere. Now, you really don't want to get too uh, involved with that. It's... Um, and I'm saying this because I know how easy it is to think, oh, it's a bit of blue sea. I better make sure that my viewer knows that it's sea. So I'll put a little yacht on it or I'll put waves in there or something like that. It's really not necessary. Um, your viewer won't give a jot as to what that is because it's not, it's going to be about this. Um, so just, we'll just have a little sort of blue slither there, sort of wedge shape. So there we are. So we got, I think, probably enough of the drawing there. I will just zoom in for a minute so you can see my drawing a little bit closer. Before we continue, please consider subscribing to my channel. And if you want immediate notifications as to when I upload a new video, then please remember to also click on the bell icon. Let me just zoom in. It will go out of focus so you can see, um, I think I should put, put, point this out. Um, the wall, even though it's broken up with quite a busy array of shapes in here, I, I'm hoping you can still get the sense of a, a linear horizontal line. There's, I don't see the wall as um, a mass of individual shapes. So this, you need to sort of see the wall to get a sense that the wall is, a, is one long horizontal traveling across the ground. You, you do need to achieve that effect. And as I say, I tend to sort of make the pencil uh, stay on the paper. So you're creating lines between each little shape that you're making. That way you really give your viewer the, the sense that there is, a, there is a horizontal through here because there's a lot of vertical line in the building behind. So it shouldn't be too difficult to suggest that horizontal. So a sense of horizontal, sense of vertical, um, uh, and a random foreground. OK, I'm going to zoom back out, and we'll get some paint going. There, refocus. Just refocusing, making sure that's clear for everybody. Let me just put that there a second, probably better. And there we are. Okay. We'll take a little bit of a pause here while you gather your thoughts on that one, folks. Um, perhaps I should erase. I know you probably can't see them. I did put them in very lightly, the grid lines this time. We'll just get rid of them anyway. And I don't think there's any pencil work in there at the moment that I need to get rid of, but it might be by the end of the painting, one or two pencil lines might need to come out. So 
Okay, so I'm going to start, I think, with the, the, the round brush, the big round brush. So I'm putting it in the water, dunking the brush in the water here. Um, and there's, here's another question. Is the sky, how important is the sky in this painting? Well, first of all, there is a fair bit of it. Um, but, you know, imagine this. Imagine if we made it a, a really stormy sky. And so there was a lot of shape and there was a lot of texture in the sky. What we'd probably end up with then is a, uh, is a painting that looks too busy because there's going to be a lot of busyness here, okay? You think of all those shapes, individual shapes down here. If we go making the sky equally busy, you probably won't want to look at the painting at the end of it. it it'll just be too busy. Um, so I think it's far safer to use the sky and a section of the foreground, okay? This, this really is how my brain works now. Um, use the sky, use this section of the foreground as our soft areas, our peaceful, flat areas, restful areas, call it what you want, but not busy. So that's, that's the reasoning behind keeping a simple flat, flat-ish sky. And I'm picking up a little bit of um, ultramarine here and a little bit of cerulean blue, quite weak to start off with. You can always make it darker once you've got the paint going. Now, last week, if you remember, I pre-wet the sky area and you could do that today as well if you want, uh, because um, I can paint quickly. Um, I'm used to painting quickly. I'm just not going to uh, pre-wet the sky on this occasion so that we can hopefully get things finished. Um, now, we'll go over the, um, the, the, the roof there because it's such a weak color. Um, and I'll go over the land and I'll go over the sea. We'll go over the sea. And you could even come down into some of the foreground because let's face it, the blue, okay, they stay out of the actual buildings, but the blue is one part of uh, green, isn't it? Blue and yellow make a, make a green. So there's absolutely no harm bringing the sky blue color down into some of the foreground because it's just, uh, it, you know, we, we, it's part of the color green. The only thing I, I, I want you to do now is just um, start spattering a little bit because by spattering here in the foreground, that will allow for um, pockets of white paper that hopefully our poppies will be able to uh, uh, pop, pop out, excuse the pun, excuse the, um, the pun, yeah. Um, you know, you, ju you just need to sort of start thinking about the, the type of texture that we're dealing with for the foreground. But I have stayed out of the wall and I've stayed out of the buildings. Now, I think that sky, you know, often I will warm a sky like that up a little bit. Um, I'm going to take a small, I mean a very small amount of raw sienna here. But this is the thing. We know it's still wet, okay? But this loading has to be the same wet. What you're putting on here now it has to be have the same water content to it as the um, the blue that you had in the brush a moment ago to do the sky. You can't put this raw sienna in with a brush that's got more water in it than than it had when it was doing the blue of the sky. You've got to match that load for that to work. So if you had too much water in the brush when you were putting that warmth in, you would end up with a lot of cauliflowering and back running, which can work in a sky sometimes, but we need to know um, we need to know what's happening all the time so you can make those choices. Now, if I put didn't put enough water in it and I put quite a bit of paint in there, you'd have a different effect that wouldn't be very nice at all. You'd have um, you'd have paint that didn't want to move. It wouldn't look like a sky because the um, it wouldn't want to move. There would be no softness. There would be hard edges to, to, to what you're adding to the sky. So that's how important really the um, getting the loading right of a brush is. Um, there's that bit of land over here, and this is just a mix of both the raw sienna and the uh, blue. And I am using raw sienna. I always 
make that clear because I use burnt sienna a lot with with ultramarine blue and this is raw sienna there's that bit of land back there there's a little bit of land over here as we know same strength of mix as um as this but um slightly stronger than what i was putting in the sky okay now probably when this is dry remember this is the sea this area here is the sea probably when that's dry. I don't think it's a good idea to put it in now. This is too wet to do a line along the shoreline there. We know the shoreline is, is there, but if you do it now, it will just, because it's wet, it will just get lost and disappear. Um, you know, the odd mark at the moment and let things reflect into the sea, that's fine. But we probably will want a slightly better delineation of that shoreline over there. Okay. Now, I'm going to put something warm in the building. So that's raw sienna again. And um, even though the cottage, to all intents and purposes, looks white, doesn't it? It's probably been whitewashed with lime or whatever, um, protect it from the, the uh, elements, the sea. Um, but it's not really white. It's... Um, the nearer building has got a lot of this warm ochre in it. So that's what I'm sticking with for the moment. Now I'm staying off the very top, you know, going back to what we're saying about using masking fluid. This is how I get my uh, areas of white paper. Unlike people who, who, who choose to use those that choose to use masking fluid, I would just simply paint around what it is I don't want to contaminate with paint at this point. So um it allows me to work much quicker um and in a way more accurate too because you know um i'm um i'm able to choose exactly what the shapes of those um light areas are because why do we use masking fluid why do people choose to move, use masking fluid it's to protect white areas and light light areas in your painting so I just, as I say, I, I prefer to sort of create those shapes um, by painting around them. So I've warmed up the nearer building, okay? I'm nowhere near where the tonal value is on this building yet, um, on the shadowed side, um, but there's the clue. It's the shadow side, because we, we, we'll, we'll change the tone of this later when the shadow goes in. But what I can do, is now I'm mixing up a very weak ultramarine blue and very weak raw sienna. And we can look at that things like, um, there's a line here and it, and it is shadow. And I know that I will be doing shadow again later, but we can just give ourselves a clue as to what's coming later, if you like. So, so make sure this is weak. This is not the actual shadow. The actual shadow will go on towards the end of the painting. But this is just giving me some ideas where the lights and the darks are. Same thing, just ultramarine blue, raw sienna. And that's a sort of dark area here. It looks like there's ivy. It's probably ivy um, growing up this old uh, wall here quite dark here, which is good because that the darker I go here, just here, um, the more the um, reflected light that's hitting the top of the wall will look, okay? Okay, now then, I'm gonna spatter again down here with the same color. I've got this, I haven't changed the color at all. This is just ultramarine blue and raw sienna. I will do, sorry, I'm just, uh, Cleaning in my cleaning my brush here. Just going to soften some of those shapes that I made back there on that. Remember, it's vertical, okay? It's a vertical wall to the to the building, so you can make some vertical brush strokes. Um, yeah, sorry. Let's let's go into this foreground again, and I'm mixing up the same two colors: ultramarine blue, raw sienna. And I'm going to do some further spattering. 
and, and, and it's great because, you know, there, there is still wet paint here from the initial washes. And, you know, when it falls on there, of course, it's a much softer shape. But when, because I've left a lot of white paper here, um, these, uh, these shapes are changing. They're obviously, they're, they're going to be more defined, aren't they, where they fall on the dry paper. Um, I think I need, um, a, a, from about this point here, we need to show off the edge of the field. And probably the colour that I've got on my brush now is probably about perfect for that. So just make, with the point of the brush, just make some hit and miss shapes back there. Nothing too strong, you know, in terms of tone, because you can always go back into there later. But from, from here back, that wall, when we get there, might do a bit now, um, we need to make some darker, more clear shapes. So let's see what we can do again with this area. Well, I'm going to take the belly of the brush, same two colours, I put a little bit of ultramarine, uh, cerulean blue in with the ultramarine blue, a bit more raw sienna, rolling the brush around on its belly like this, not the point. You know, it, there's no, um, there's no advantage. I was going to say something, there's no point to this, but that would be too corny. There's no point to loading the point of the brush. Um, I just roll the whole brush around on its belly like that. That gives me a complete loading of the brush because that way I can make much bigger shapes much quicker. Okay, so. so all this sort of peripheral around here can have this type of paint application. But wherever, we're, we're, you know, are working, trying to work ahead of ourselves, I think let's try to be, um, you know, a couple of steps ahead. Um, you want these areas to be slightly more um, hard of edged. Most of your shapes in here to be hard of edged. What I'm doing at the edge is softening. It's as simple as that. And I, this is where I'm going to pick up a little bit of burnt sienna this time for, for the first time. And a little bit of cad yellow, cadmium yellow. Not too much of it. It's just, I'm just creating a warm brown yellowy brown okay and um and th this this is areas of warmth so it's a lot of if you if you're not inclined to work with the belly of the brush much this is a great exercise for because it's so important um to to know the anatomy of a brush and and not to think you know it's 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 only ever about the point of the brush I actually don't, there are paintings, particularly like this one, I, where um, I definitely use more of the belly of the brush than I do the point. Or more area, larger areas of the painting get covered by the, this work, the belly of the brush, not the point. That's what I should say, you know. Time-wise, I might spend as much time working with the point of the brush as I do with the belly of the brush. But spatial area, um, Definitely the belly of the brush gets the lion's share. Creep this way a little bit. This is very, this is very intuitive. You, um, you sort of got to imagine what's a soft bit of ground up here. So notice I've sort of stayed out of the uh, wall. Okay. And I've stayed out a lot of where I want to show my poppies off. So a lot of the poppies are going to have to land on this weak greeny blue mix, greeny yellow, brown, blue, variegated mix. OK, so that's why um, it's my plan to use white gouache when in the poppies, in the reds, so that they don't get lost. The color doesn't sink. Um, 
the white gouache will prevent the, the paint from sinking in and getting lost in the greens. Right, I think, I think probably what I need to do now um, is um, speed dry this because there's no advantage now to letting it dry naturally of its own accord. Um, so I'm gonna speed dry it very quickly. It's not absolutely bone dry. You know, if I put the back of my hand in areas, I can still feel the dampness. But this was just for practical reasons, so that if I rest my hand anywhere now, because that's what I'm going to be doing, um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not spoiling an area because it's still wet. So let's turn our attention to the number six uh, pointed round brush. And uh, so this, this is where you'll see me use, um, I'll, um, I'll swap the raw sienna for burnt sienna at this point. So blue remains the same, ultramarine. Find a dry, and I'm looking for, I think I'm gonna have to dry this off because there's too much uh, water in that little well. I'll dry it out, pick up my ultramarine blue, place it in here. Pick up a bit of burnt sienna this time then. Okay, burnt sienna, not raw sienna. Tiny bit of moisture, which I'll borrow from there. So I'm looking to create uh, the first real dark of this painting. And I can put a little bit of cerulean blue in there because I don't wanna to go to the darkest dark at this stage. The cerulean blue will keep that dark from going too dark. So what, I'm going to, what am I going to do with this? Um, I'm starting to um, think about these recesses, the windows that were in this old wall at one time. Um, there's windows down here. I think it needs to be a tiny bit warmer. So I'll just add a bit more burnt sienna. And then get that that line there, right. It's important to get that line there. My pencil line, I noticed just before I painted that, was slightly out. It was going a little too flat. It was too horizontal, okay? But the perspective, subtle as it is, it will be noticed if it's wrong. It's just a very subtle right to left downward slope, really subtle. Um, then I always like to sort of just Put a broken line. So this is dry brush technique. Broken line down the eaves here to show off the triangle. Um, there's a ridge along the top of that roof. Usually it'll dip in these old buildings in, in that ridge. Even though it's a very short line from one chimney to the other, I still like to show a little hint of a, a, a you know, a bow um, where time and weather has made it, um, has taken its toll on that sort of, uh, on that roof. So be really careful. I did just put a line down the far end of that roof, but um, I know that if by the end of this, um, if that little line, and it's much fainter than the other lines, but if it is still too strong, then um, we'd need to sort of do a little trick with gouache because that line to the furthest edge of the roof must no, that's one line you do not make strong leave it out even I, I i only really put it there to remind myself of the angle of the slope for now um if i were to get a bit heavy-handed accidentally and make that a really dark line i'd really have to try and get it off because it's a sh flat, shiny surface, the roof, and it's basically um, sitting against um, a sky background um, that is quite close to the same tone. And by putting a hard line down that far edge, you, it, it gives the visual optical impression that it's closer. Um, 
then it's closer than it actually is. And you'd have to go really bold on this one here to make, to counteract, to, 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 to play off that. Um, the worst thing you could do is make that one really strong and this one too light. If you make that one a little bit too strong, you'll have to go into this one and make it even stronger. This must be the stronger line from those two parallel horizontal uh, diagonals. Right, okay, so it just, my paint mix is just getting a bit too dry there, so I'll get the paint off. So chimney, what's, what do we do with a chimney? It's just a, a vertical line on this left-hand side. Um, and then the top of this roof, I, I use my finger a lot here. These are dot dashes. Um, you know, it, it's, you can't, you can't say what they are. It's something growing. It's it's a change of angle at the top of the wall. Um, that that's all it really is. Now, I put my finger on it just to break it up to make it look textual, as though it is weeds or um, ivy growing up there. I'm going to use a bit of phthalo green in a moment, just so we can sort of infer um, a little bit of ivy, and that. Thalo green is going into the edge of this dry paint mix. Okay, this is very dry textual application now. And then I'll come to the other side of that little dry puddle where it's warmer and put some of that in and around this ivy. And I use, see, I use the, my finger a lot. You know, it will go on like this. And if I, if I feel as though that's gone a bit too heavy, I'm straight on onto it with the ball of my finger like that and just take some off. It's growing, it seems to be growing in this sort of fashion. It seems to come up to about here. There's a vertical line there at the end of the wall. And I notice that the, this texture, which is ivy, I just think of it as a texture and a shape, I notice that it peters out before it goes to ground. It doesn't reach the ground. It just comes down to the wall about here, something like this, almost like curtains hanging down a wall. Like that. Sometimes a little bit of burnt sienna goes into that phthalo green, just to warm places up. Now, I quite like the fact that it's, but you, do you see how, I'm gonna zoom in again for you, just to see how dry this is. It must be dry and textural, this paint. Yes, get in there, there we are. Um, it must be dry and textural, full of texture. So the paint mix is like mixing one of those epoxy glues, two part glues that you've got to mix together. There's very little water in it. It can, it will look, and it is just now, it's starting to sort of look a little bit too dry and a little bit strange. So what I'll do, I'll show you what I do about that in a moment. The most important thing at this point is just to get this dry texture paint in as you see it. It's a wall, so I notice the brush mark is going vertical. Go sideways at the top. It goes across like this at the top of the wall, but on the actual face of the wall, I turn my brush movement to a vertical brush mark like this. Okay, um, you'll see me do some something similar in this wall. But the, here's a really interesting thing that we brought up last week, and I bring up a lot: the seventy thirty ratio. Okay, how do we make what's behind the wall not get lost? with what's in, actually in the wall, this wall in front. How do we make that separate to that? Because, simple, the 70% in the cottage is a vertical brush stroke, as, like I'm, as I'm doing here. When we get to the wall, not only will the color change to a warmer, more burnt sienna color, you'll see me use the uh, horizontal uh, application of paint here, like this, okay? And that's, those are the subtle things that are, those are the really clever things that, you know, you, you need to learn to, to, to establish. Um, to, your, your paintings will start looking far more sophisticated uh, when you learn those particular sort of techniques. 
and being mindful of it, being sensitive to it. Okay, I said um, a moment ago about, you know, that's probably, that texture is probably a little artificial, it's too harsh looking. So this is what I do. I take the same brush that I was using to put the paint on with, and um, I'll just make sure there's no paint in it, but there is a lot of water in that brush. I better come back out in a moment, but I'm just gonna show you this. Um, and I'm just going to say, well, I think if I land the brush here, I'll just soften some areas of that texture, okay? Not, don't go mad because you, you, you'll spoil it. You, you, you'll lose the texture if you go, if you do too much of this. But within some of the edges, around some of the edges and sometimes within the shape of that textural paint, I go in with this wet brush. There is an opportunity to warm sections up too. So even though that's only water, it's picking up the existing pigment, which is mostly a cold green. So why don't we take the opportunity to warm just one or two sections up, very watery, but this time with a little bit of burnt sienna in it. What we'll do is we'll allow a little bit of warmth, a little bit of warmth just to sort of creep in to that texture. And that's it, more or less, okay? Um, so, now we still need to probably show off a little bit of this nearer building. So I'm gonna to have to go back to a little bit more of the dry brush um, technique. So I'm finding a little corner over here where there's not too much water, just up here, or you can't see that. So let me just zoom back out. Just get focused again. Oops. Okay. Um, so I might just need the right coolish color for this dry, dry brush. Uh, I might just need to sort of show the horizontal line to the chimney there. There doesn't seem to be much evidence of chimney pots. So I won't worry too much about that. Um, but we probably do need to show that there is a top to this area. And there's a top to this little wall that comes down here. There's a triangle in here made up of a wall, Some br little brick faces in there like that. I wouldn't do too much of that, otherwise you lose it and this won't look as good. There's a, this shape here, it's quite important, this shape in here, in here this triangle remains you keep that intact. Around it, the more you go around it, the better that will look. Okay. Okay, um, let's get to the poppies. So um, let's get a little bit of white out. Okay, this is white gouache. And I'm gonna start with, I'm gonna put a little bit of that over here. Um, actually, let's, let's put it somewhere where you can see it. It's in camera shot. 
when I'm done with this painting, that white gouache has to come off because it's incredibly adhesive. It, um, it doesn't like coming off the palette and it will contaminate your transparent colors. So be very careful. Sometimes I just use a little pickle jar lid for this, um, keep it separate. So I'm taking the white on the brush won't get much off that because it's not, a, not enough water and just putting a bit more water on this brush. So let's put a little bit of white here. Now, if you're not, um, if, if spattering this way is still something quite new to you, I, what I suggest you do is this. You, you, you take a bit of scrap paper, okay? And you just mask off the areas you don't want because this will be red paint in a moment, remember, okay? You just, mask off the areas you don't want the um, the red poppies to appear in, i.e. the sky. We're okay in front of the wall. You'd expect to see some poppies in front of the wall. So let me just do this now as I would. So a lot of paint in, a lot of white paint in this brush. I, I'm quite used to sort of spattering, so I will get the odd stray um, a bit of paint in the sky, but um, it's very rarely enough to spoil. So I just keep going back and forth. Now I'll pick up that little bit of uh, cadmium red here, and I'm pushing it, I'll show you. I'm pushing it into this white. There's my white paint, which I, I've been using. I've brought it over here, and that's uh, cadmium red. As soon as you put white with it, goes pink, okay? Because it cools the red off, and that makes, you know, pink is a cool red, basically. So this is, I have to speed this up, folks, and because you know, I want to get this finished for you in the in our given time. And then I'll really go to town in in this area over here. Because you know, there's there is there are a good number of poppies in the photo over here on this left hand side, which is fine. You've got plenty of scope. You can, you know, you 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 can do too much, but it, um, you, yeah, I wouldn't be too worried of overdoing it. Let's put it that way. Okay. Got a rather large deposit of white gouache there, which I'm going to get rid of. Now I'm going to spat it with a green mix. So do you remember the um, phthalo green mix that I had on the go up here with some burnt sienna in it? I also put a bit of yellow, cadmium yellow in that. And we'll spatter again. You may notice that I had um, Payne's Grey on the colour list, but it, this is one of those paintings where it's, it's just a standby colour. If for some reason, you know, something's running away with you and you need to make one of your mixes dark very quickly, um, that's where I would call upon the Payne's Grey. I haven't needed it so far. <laughs> So changing the green again, sometimes a bright green, sometimes just a dark green. And again, you know, if you're worried, particularly with this darker color, you don't want too much of that in the sky. If you if you just put a piece of paper over the areas that you don't want the um, this color to appear in. Warm it up again with some, so I've changed this green three times already. And that's the important thing about greens. Why greens are such a tricky color for people um, is because I think we rely on tube greens, um, you know, and they can look very artificial. Just make a green, doesn't matter what it is, but keep changing it. Change it to warm, change it to cool as you work. Takes a bit of patience, <laughs> this. Now, 
I'm not sure whether we, I'll get time to show you um, this, but what you'll end up with um, is an overly textured foreground. OK, at some point you're going to and I'll show you what I do to fix that, because it can be you, you can end up with too much texture. OK, even even though it's the foreground. So what I'll do is I'll get to a point where I'm quite happy with the um, with, with the shapes and the effects, okay? Um, I'll do what, something similar to what I did earlier. Okay, and, it's, and that is, um, I'll take, go back to the big round brush, take up that paint that you've just been using and go back in again to areas, particularly around the edges here. You're starting to lose a little bit more of the white, okay? And this could, this same technique could be used for um, bluebell woods, bluebell wood paintings. Um, so if you're planning on getting into painting bluebell woods, you'd use the same approach. Well, I, I would. <laughs> this this is how I would approach it. So, and then somewhere up here we need to do something similar. Now then. Once you've done this, once you've got this sort of texture back as to how you like it, you probably find you need to put more poppies on again, okay? So they will get lost. And I'm putting a lot of water in this uh, green color at the moment, just to get down the end of the field there. It's a really weak green color down the end of the field. Because what you've got to try to do is eventually lose as much of the white or areas that look like white as possible. Okay, you don't want too much of that. Let's speed dry this. And so we would repeat this until, as I say, we're happy. Put a couple of individual, uh, I'm using cadmium red here, straight, neat, pure paint just to highlight some of this, some of these um, nearer uh, poppies that, that we got in the field here, okay? Just the odd, hit, hit the surface of the paper with the point of the brush in a rather random fashion. Put a little bit of yellow now in some of that, in some of those. Not too much of the yellow. Got a little bit of that. And a bit, a bit more spatter. You know, it's it's a bit like adding cordial to your water. We all have a different sense of um, taste. We all have different tastes. But you want a balance. The, the, the final, the, the, the ultimate thing is to is to achieve balance. So that you haven't got too much red over here, or you haven't got too much green over here. Um, so do regularly check the progress. Stand aside, um, take, uh, um, have a cup of tea to hand and take, and I do, even though I'm, I know I talk about painting quickly and not wanting the momentum to stop or be broken. And that it, 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 this is one exception I would certainly make. I would just sort of down tools for a moment and look at the, look at the balance, look for balance. Is it, is it too much? Have you done too much? Are you nearly doing too much? Stop, you know, does it need a bit more? Right, so brings us to the finishing touches, and I'm going to speed dry that again. Um, and that is, of course, the shadows. Okay. Um, now, as usual, um, I, I never think I'm painting shadows. I always think I'm painting light, because that's what shadows provide. There's no light really in this painting because there's no shadows. Okay. So I'm just putting a little bit of dry brush warmth in here. I just think it needs it. Um, yeah, so let's speed dry this and finish the painting by applying our shadows. Before I can do that, I must get rid of these colors, which I know will contaminate. Get rid of that white. That's the first one to go. Let's get rid of that. Um, Yeah, because I want a nice clean surface to create my shadows. 
probably won't need this big area on the right hand side of my palette. Um, we should be able to make enough shadow mix in these two wells here. Okay, so there is the painting minus the light. I'm, I'm teasing. What I mean is, it's the painting minus the shadow. Um, so, um, you know, if you when you come to watch this back on video, you could, if you like, pause here, you know, make a comparison at this point, what the painting looks like before the shadows go on. Um, because there's temptation to say, well, it looks okay. You know, why, why, why spoil it? Because we, we do think we're going to spoil our paintings by putting the shadow in, because it's such a scary thing to do, is to paint over all that lovely stuff that we created. Um, but you really have to bite the bullet here. And, and um, you know, if you really want to move forward, uh, learn to paint shadows and uh, not be afraid. Let's put the mount around it. That always, by putting the mount around it, it isolates all the paraphernalia and distraction from around your working area and it helps you see it for balance in terms of balance. Hope that was good. Hope you enjoyed that. And, um, and uh, I look forward to seeing the finished works.